I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. I actually hate talking about myself, but um, I have been doing web building and design and marketing since 1997. I did it part-time from 97 to 2004. In 2004, I started a full-time agency, and now I have a boutique agency with about a half dozen people. And uh, based out of Montreal, I'm just here for the weekend. And uh, all right, that's enough about me. Um, I've been looking around at different restaurants and noticing that a lot of restaurants are really kind of the same thing. So if, if you've been to a Casey's or a Kelsey's or these other restaurants, you realize that there's really nothing special about them or their advertising. It's always like, here's a picture of our food, here's a happy family, and you know, come to our restaurant. Nothing stands out. And I look at that and I was looking at that and thinking, okay, well, how would they market this? If they were doing content marketing, how would they market it? What kind of content would they put out there? Uh, and then I compared it to some differentiated bar and grill restaurants like these. And I think, you know what? These guys, all three of them lend themselves to being uh, marketed, not in a direct way like these guys, where it's like, here's all the commercials, here's our ads, come, come see us. But in this case, the people who actually come to eat there, the patrons, are the ones who are doing the marketing for them. So if you go like to Planet Hollywood, for example, and while it's not as popular as it used to be, um, the restaurants that are still there have this, um, they, like this kind of angle, like this unique angle, where they have memorabilia from different movies, and people come in and they're like, oh, there's like uh, the robotic arm from Terminator, that's so cool. And what do they do? What's the first thing you do now? You take out your phone and take a picture of it. And then many of you will actually go a step further and put it on Instagram and say, I'm at Planet Hollywood, look how cool this thing is. Uh, and they're doing the marketing for you. Um, so Planet Hollywood, Hard Rock, Hooters, they're getting people to do the marketing for them without even asking them. And that's actually um, a really important point. It's something I want you to think about when I talk about content marketing. Now, what is content marketing? I can give you a long, complicated explanation, or I can give you this simple way to look at it. In content marketing, the content is the ad. Now compare this to the content of your ad. They're two completely separate things. This is editorial content versus advertising content. So let me show you an example. So this is a screenshot of CityNet Magazine. It's, um, it's a magazine that I run out of Montreal, but we do have uh, articles written in Toronto as well. So if anybody's out there looking to write some articles, we'll definitely uh, consider your contributions. Now, I created a fictional page for a fictional restaurant called Little Japan. Now think about this. Imagine you run Little Japan and you think you have the best sushi in Toronto. You have the best sushi in town. You want everybody to know that you've got the best sushi in town. Would you prefer to have an ad on the side of somebody's article that says, come to Little Japan, we have the best sushi in town, or that a reporter comes to your restaurant, eats, loves it, and says, you know what? Little Japan really does have the best sushi in town and goes and writes an article about it. Which one of these are you gonna trust more? That's the key difference here. In content marketing, the content of the, that people produce the third party content is much more relevant and important than the advertising message that you are trying to push on other people. So you need to stop thinking like an advertiser and start thinking like a publisher, and that's really key. So what kind of content am I talking about? So I know I'm in a room full of bloggers, you're thinking about text and blogs, but there's a lot more to it. There's more to uh, content than just blogs. Photos, videos, uh, audio, podcasts, now, a lot of people kind of shrug their shoulders, like, ah, podcasts, who cares? I gotta tell you, podcasts are coming back. They were really hot for a while, then they disappeared, and they're coming back. See, the beauty of a podcast is that you get a direct one-to-one -one relationship or line with your audience, with your clients. It's really fantastic. Think about it. Somebody, you write a blog post, Somebody's reading that blog post, they're easily distracted. They're like, oh, what's, what's the related post? Uh, oh, I like, got a little pop up on my screen. Somebody sent me an iMessage. You're getting all these different messages, competing information, and you quickly look away. But if you're listening to a podcast, you're saying, okay, for the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to listen ex to exactly what somebody said and what somebody is saying. And that's really key. And the ability to get podcasts on your um, mobile devices has become so popular and so easy that it's becoming more and more popular. Now, infographics. A lot of people actually don't know what infographics are, so I just wanna make it clear. This is an example of an infographic. Now, 
I really love this one in particular. It's basically taking information and laying it out in a very visually stimulating or pleasant way. So this was put out by HalloweenCostumes.com. And what they did was they were showing the history of Superman's S. Now it's much bigger than I could fit here, so I put that little squiggly line in. But I, I'm, a, I'm a big comic book fan, and I love this. I read every single blurb because I was actually fascinated by what information that they had to share with me. And then at the very it's very discreetly HalloweenCostumes.com. So if I really like this infographic, I might share it, but I might also go to HalloweenCostumes.com and maybe buy a costume. So these are the types of content that you need to consider, and this is what I'm talking about. So now the question is, how do you find your ideal audience? And that's really what I'm going to be talking about today. It's the ideal audience that you want. Those are the people um, that are going to make a difference for you. So our story begins with the X-Men. So I'm really into comic books. I've been reading X-Men since I was a kid. And uh, for those of you who don't know, the X-Men is a bunch about, about a bunch of people who have superpowers. And in the Marvel Comics universe, they are called mutants. Now, mutants are always fighting. The, there's good mutants versus bad mutants. And um, in the last X-Men movie, there was actually a take on what happens in the comic where somebody named Bolivar Trask, he's this like evil scientist, creates these robots called so you can see them up at the top flying. Um, they're these guys, giant robots that basically detect who is a human and who is a mutant and goes around and kills them. Now, what do they do? What do the X-Men do? Okay, they put out a trailer. So they get a guy like me super excited. I'm sharing it all over the place. I'm like, guys, the X-Men trailer. Oh, this is so cool. I've been reading this comic book since I was a fetus. This is amazing. <laughs> um, and, you know, and, and the word gets out. And they put out like samples of the posters and all that. And that's great. That's really great. But they took it a step further. Because remember, we're looking for the ideal audience. How do they find an ideal audience? So Bolivar, Bolivar evil scientist, owns a company, runs a company called Trask Industries. And what do the people behind the movie do? they put out a website called Trask Industries. And this, this actually exists. You can go visit this website. This is fantastic content marketing. They're not pushing a sale. There's no mention of the movie, nothing like that. But I'm their ideal audience, and I ate this up. And, and it's got, I mean, it looks professional. Um, you see the character from the movie. Uh, the actor. Um, it's true to what a Trask Industries would do, preserving humanity through technology, and responding to the genetic threat, et cetera, et cetera. Really, really fascinating. And they're not shoving anything down your throat. That's what's so fantastic about this. Now, generally speaking, growing your audience has two major steps, content creation and content promotion. You need to create the content, push it out, get it out there. Create content, put it out. It's like two major steps to consider. So. Um, I'm going to focus mo mostly on the content creation, and by the end, I'll get the promotion. But that's not really the main focus of today's talk. Now, when you're creating content, here's something to consider. Blogging is not a strategy. Guest blogging is not a strategy. Infographics are not a strategy. And let's make a viral video is not a strategy. You cannot make viral videos. You make videos viral, great, but if they don't, so be it. And most videos are not going to go viral. Uh, people call me all the time saying, uh, yeah, we need to make a viral video. That's our marketing strategy. Like, no, it's not. It doesn't work that way. Um, so these are tactics, okay? If you do, if you're a blogger, okay, and you don't have an overall strategy, you're, you're just using a tactic. You need to look at the big picture. So I break down the big picture into three main areas. Content strategy, specific goals, and then tactics. So what's content strategy? Those are your business objectives or your blogger objectives. What are you trying to do as a blogger or as a business? Brand awareness, increase personal branding, uh, increase revenue. What is your objective for your specific campaign? Then you want to break it down and get more specific. What actions do you want your audience to take to, in order to achieve your objective? So do you want them to sign up for your newsletter, which by the way, uh, email sign up letters, recommended. Um, I'm not talking about them today in, in any detail, but I really suggest you work on that in terms of growing your audience. Uh, setting up an appointment, providing an estimate, or let's go down here, for example, free trial. So if you want to increase the bottom line, you're, and let's suppose you're selling software, and you know that every, for every five people or every fifth person that downloads your software is going to buy. 
you want to encourage the free trials. You want to get those out there. So if your overall objective is, let's say, increase branding and increase revenue, you can go out, write a few blog posts for your, on your own blog and write some guest posts a great article and post it on somebody else's blog. Um, talk about the merits of your software, help people out, and uh, offer them the free trial. So they go to another website, they read the article, they say, hey, this is great, this is what I need. They click on the link that says free trial, they download it, and you know that every fifth person is actually there from you. That way, you've satisfied all your needs. That's really the key. So you have your overall objectives, your specific goals, and you've used the tactic of guest blogging. That's the way to do it. Now, the question is, what content is gonna resonate the most with your audience? And the answer is, it's content that you care about. So how do you create content that people are going to care about? Two steps, and this is gonna be the majority of my talk. Create personas, I'm gonna talk about that first. Okay, find your target audience. And second, give that audience what they want. Let me walk you through it. So first of all, a persona. What is a persona? A persona is a fictional representation of your ideal customer. They don't necessarily exist in exactly the way you think, but um, it's a character that you need to create. And each business, or even as a blogger, will have multiple personas. They're different people you're gonna go after. And personas are broken down into two main aspects. One is demographics. Demographics is the easy one. We all fit into that. We all have an age, we all have a gender, we are all located somewhere, um, we all have an education level, marital status, and so on. That's the demographics. Psychographics are specific, unique idios idiosyncrasies among your persona. So we look at their needs, their wants, uh, buying behavior. If you're trying to sell something to kids, Really, you might really want to market to parents who are going to buy for their kids because the kids themselves don't buy. Um, you want to look at the specifics of your target audience. Now, uh, a great way to look at personas is, um, yeah, is through this next slide, Samuel Jackson. When you're thinking, if you're thinking of a prototype of a persona, think of Samuel Jackson. You ever notice that in the Avengers, Captain America, Star Wars, Pulp Fiction, Die Hard, Snakes on a Plane, etc., he's always the t confident, tough guy. He's always the same guy. He's very rigid. You know, he, he yells a lot. Um, he's like, you know, don't worry, we're going to get through this, whatever. Um, he's, he's always the same guy because he's been typecast. In all these movies, he's the same guy. That's your persona. Very rigid, limit, limitations. You set the, the, uh, the barriers as to what you expect this person to do and what this person not to do. So when you're creating a persona, you have to consider that. Now, how do you create a persona? First of all, brainstorm. Sit around, get friends, colleagues, coworkers, get them, uh, get them to sit down, spend an hour, throw out a whole bunch of ideas. There are no wrong ideas. Um, there's better or worse, but there are no wrong ideas. And don't be shy. Um, you know, get, jot them down. Uh, don't cheat. I don't know why this guy is cheating, but he is. Um, don't cheat. Uh, yeah, he failed the brainstorming session. Now you want to get out keywords, ideas, one way to really keep track of everything during your brainstorming session is to use a tool like MindNode. So mind, um, you can mind map using a tool like mind, MindNode, where basically you create uh, these mind maps where you can just create these bubbles and you can expand the bubbles, break them up, and really get uh, your different ideas together. So as, more, as you build on your ideas and more and more comes out, you can easily work it through. Uh, I can assure you these things will get really gigantic, but they are fantastic. Uh, they're extremely helpful for uh, planning. Okay, so let me give you an example of uh, a little connection with a persona and a mind map. Um, my company, my, one of, I have a few companies, my main company is Unicio, and we have two main personas. One is professionals and small, medium-sized businesses. The other one is large corporations. So for large corporations, so because I only run a company with just a few people, uh, for large corporations, we go in and we do training and we do consulting and give second opinions and so forth. So large companies like the Yellow Pages will come to us or Cirque du Soleil and they'll say, give us some training, uh, consult with us, what have you. But we're not, we're not established enough in a way like, like we're not built in a way to develop websites for Cirque du Soleil. Like that's just something beyond what my company can do. We only offer them advice and guidance. 
So that's one, um, one main area that we go after. Another one, and that's going to be the focus of my example here, is um, the professional small and medium-sized businesses. In particular, we happen to do a lot of websites for plastic surgeons. Like, it's a win-win all around. We make these guys tons of money. And um, one of the uh, areas that I would look at in particular for plastic surgeons is, OK, we'll look at their location and experience level and so on. But we want to know what their business interests are. Are they starting a practice? Or are they going to be retiring soon? Because if they're retiring soon, I, there's not a lot I can do for them. But if they're starting a practice, Yes, there's a lot I can do for them. So I would go down that route. Now, I would make another mind map of all the services that we can provide. So we have web design services, web development, SEO training, consulting, and so on. And I put them all into all these different clusters. And the trick is, how do I combine them? How do I bring together my services I can provide to that audience? And so in this case, I look at a plastic surgeon who's starting a practice and in my example here, I'm going to say they might need a responsive website. Maybe they have some website already and it's time to upgrade because so many people are using uh, mobile devices. So you make that connection. So the content I'm going to create is going to be about the importance of responsive design or mobile web design for plastic surgeons. That will be the key. That's a service I want to provide to the target audience. Now, how do I do that? Well, I can write an article and publish it in a plastic surgery magazine. Certainly, the target audience is reading it. Um, I can write a little and offer it as incentive to plastic surgeons and say, OK, I tell you what, if you um, give me your name and email address, I'll give you this little ebook in exchange for um, uh, for giving up that information. Uh, I can create an infographic that shows how prospects are using mobile devices more than ever before, and so on. This is basically, in a nutshell, how you use personas and connect them to ideas. But part of connecting to ideas involves anticipating needs. And this is where most people fail, unfortunately. And this is really, really important. So I'm going to go on and on about this for the next few minutes. You need to anticipate consumer needs or the, uh, the need of whoever's reading your blog. So this is a picture I took at Zeller's. Uh, for those of you who may remember Zeller's, it's kind of like you know a uh, cheap version of Kmart. Um, now, at uh, or not really that cheap, as I heard a voice in the audience say. Um, okay, so this is what happened. So there was a Zeller's. So like I said, I'm from Montreal, and I come in. Um, uh, I see an ad in the paper. Uh, that said, uh, today is the last day of Zeller's at the Place Vertu Mall, um, which is in Ville Saint Laurent, next to my office. And I'm like, oh, well, this is like five minutes away. I can go check it out. You know, 90% off. Let's see what's up. So I go over there. This is what I find. Um, I mean, look at the shelves. They're demolished. They're destroyed. I mean, you look up demolished in, in Wikipedia. This is the picture that I should upload. Because look at that. It's completely empty. Uh, everything's, it's 90% off. Um, people destroyed everything, except one thing. These lame stickers, these lame stickers about race car drivers. Sure, we have the Grand Prix, the biggest, uh, most um, uh, amazing weekend of the year, like um, in Montreal, Grand Prix weekend. It's a really big deal every June. Except that, it, aside from that, nobody really cares about race cars. But Zellers put these on the featured end of the aisle, and obviously nobody cares. So then you're wondering, why are these guys gone? They didn't anticipate consumer needs. Because if I'm not buying this at 90% off, I'm certainly not buying it when there's 0% off. Big fail. Big fail. So Zeller's closes. They're gone. Uh, I walked away with like Twizzlers that cost me like 10 cents. It was great. My office loved it. Everything was great. And then they announced, oh my god, where Zeller's was. I'm like, no way. That's really cool. Target, great. I used to live in Boston. And I used to go to Target all the time. This is wonderful. Turns out Target comes to Canada, and they fail too. Because. I wake up one day and I open my Montreal Gazette newspaper. Yes, I still read the paper. I do enjoy it. Um, physical paper. Open it up and it says, Target, last day, closing, Place Vertu Mall. I'm like, oh, no way. Okay, five minute drive. I'm going to go over there and see what's up. So I go over there and it turns out everything is 60% off. I'm like, no way. Not as good as Zeller's, but 60% off? Fantastic. But look again, sides completely empty, but they still have. Stickers. Obviously, stickers don't sell at 60% off or 90% off. Nobody cares about this stuff. Um, and I'll tell you something else. This is like really crazy. Okay, you see the physical location of the display? It's the exact same spot physically in the store. I'm not even kidding. You see the red banner at the back? It's the same red banner. It's, the, it's in the exact same spot. So they didn't anticipate consumer needs. They failed. 
and they're gone. So they're out of Canada. Uh, anticipating the needs of your audience is extremely important. So let me give you one of my favorite examples about missing opportunities. It has to do with Lauren Luke. So Lauren Luke was working uh, in a taxi company and some makeup on the side. So, so people start asking her, how do I apply the makeup? She's like, oh, okay, well, I didn't realize there was an audience for this. I'll tell you what, what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna make some videos, put them on YouTube, and that'll help you out. So she does that, and everybody and their grandmother starts following her and looking at, uh, watching her videos. And so her sales shoot up, she quits the job as, uh, as a taxi dispatcher, and, and her whole, her business takes off, and things are great. Sephora looks at this and says, wait a minute, wait a minute, we have a $20 million marketing budget and she has three times as many followers uh, on YouTube than we do. There's a problem here because Lauren Luke has approximately 600,000 followers or subscribers to her YouTube channel. Sephora has around 200,000 roughly. So it's, there, there's a problem there. So Sephora says, we're gonna put out our own line of videos. So they put this out and you can't really see because it's just a, a still shot, but the, um, that's a professional model. Um, there's a professional makeup artist applying the makeup polished, clean, white. Um, it's a very different take from Lauren Luke. It's very different. Like Lauren Luke, I mean, she's getting there, she's telling you about her day. She's telling you about what she tried and didn't work. She might screw up and tell you about it. She's walking you through the whole process. And that's a really big deal because Sephora can't do that. They can't tell you the wrong way to apply makeup. There's no city if they try to do that. I and mean, they can't put an ad on Craigslist and say, we're looking for somebody in their apartment to apply makeup and to pretend to represent us. They can't do that. So it really worked for Lauren Luke. Now, Sephora ultimately just threw in the towel. They're like, okay, it's not happening. We're giving up. Uh, and what they decide to do is just buy out Lauren Luke. So if you go to Sephora, you can actually find the Lauren Luke line of, of uh, makeup at this point. Now, Lauren Luke has totally built up her personal brand, which is really remarkable because um, she's written for a lot of major magazines and she's becoming like a, a major influencer in the industry. Now, um, where do you get information? Where do you get uh, the content you need to uh, how to anticipate needs. So here's a few things. If you're in a big company, ask customer service. If you're uh, a one-man show, you know, you're the one who answers the phone, you know the consistent questions that people are always asking. It's uh, it basically create a spreadsheet or use software that looks for the patterns because that's really um, ask current clients, ask them, what are their needs? What do they want? What would they like? What, would, what could you do better? What kind of information would be helpful for them? And ask prospective clients. Um, use, uh, do data research. So with data research, there are actually these things called data search engines where you could find out things like how many people in Zimbabwe use bank machines or like what's the birth rate of in some, uh, some random country around the world. So like websites like Xanran, Data360, like they'll give you that kind of information. Google actually gives you a lot of information as well. Uh, I strongly recommend if you're looking for demographic info, try uh, Google Public Data Explorer. It's very helpful. Consumer behavior, Google has consumer barometer. Now, um, break down silos. This is something that's really important. For those of you who work in a big company, talk to the other departments in your company. I guarantee they have something to tell you. Um, they're, they're just not because you haven't had like an interdepartmental meeting. Content marketing really works because A, people want to hire you, they want to be sold to, or they want to marvel at your product's features. What do you think? Who says A? Okay, who says B? All right, three, three, uh, you know, four, unlikely, kind of like, yeah. Okay, five. Okay, so, content, so, so five people in the room think content marketing works because really want to be sold to, okay? And C, marvel, people really want to be, they want to marvel at a product's features? How many? Okay, not bad, not bad. Um, it's a total trick question. <laughs> it's none of them. Of course not. You see, here's the thing. Content marketing works because people really want to solve their problems. They don't want to be sold to, they don't want to hire you, and they could care less about your product's features. They don't care. People don't care. Um, if you upgraded, let's say, to the latest version of iOS on your iPhone, all of a sudden things get moved around, right? And that thing that you're always doing is no longer easily, you can't do it so easily anymore. What do you do? You go to Google and you say, how do I do such and such? And you find a blog where some kind blogger has volunteered his time to write out an explanation, a step-by-step -step explanation, helping you figure out how the change has affected how you're gonna use your phone. 
You're interested in solving your problem. You read it and you say, oh my God, this is fantastic. Now I know how to do that. Okay. You don't care. You don't want to be sold to. You don't want, um, you're not looking um, to uh, hire anybody and you're not interested in marveling at somebody's features. It's all about solving problems. Your content has to solve problems. People care more about solving problems than they care about any of the other stuff here. Okay, so Dragon's Den, Shark Tank, I love these shows. Uh, for those of you who don't watch these shows, basically the idea is there are these uh, financially successful entrepreneurs who sit down and they live from startup businesses and small businesses or successful businesses that need to grow, and they say, here's our pitch, we want you to give us some money so we can grow our business uh, a little bit more. Now, I've watched every single episode of Dragon's Den since season one, and I've noticed a certain pattern. And um, there is an answer to this. Uh, how do you get a deal on Dragon's Den? What do you think? What? Who said that? What? <laughs> Good stuff. Thank you. All right, Conrad. You know what? For getting that right, I'm going to give you a copy of my book. Can we have a round of applause? <laughs> yeah. It's Solve a Problem. Can you sign it for me? But <laughs> I can sign it after, sure. Okay. That's the real key. On Dragon's Den, if you can pitch to people and solve their problems, they're gonna be interested, and that's really key. So here's the thing. While somebody out there really wants to know how many five-year-olds I could take in a fight, I could do, um, I could actually take 15. I did the quiz, it's an online quiz, you can try it out. When the zombie apocalypse comes, I'm gonna know how many, if I see 15 kids running towards me, I'm out of there, because you know, after that, it's like you know, the fuzzy boundary of what I can handle. This is pure entertainment. It's not necessarily content that's gonna convert. It's really important to understand that. Because these days, there's so much shouting, there's so much like, buy from us, buy from us, buy from us. Forget that we, like, whether we solve your problem or not, it's irrelevant. It's just buy from us, buy from us, buy from us. And that's really bad. So like, that's, that's not even good content, it's crappy content. When you publish crappy content, a puppy dies. <laughs> and you don't wanna go around killing puppies. And here's the problem, don't be a puppy killer. There's a lot of bloggers out there who think that they're bloggers and that they're running a blog, but they're not. What they're really doing is running a pet cemetery because nobody is paying attention to their crappy content, okay? Keep this in mind as you're creating content. Now, I'm gonna give you a little something to think about, which is um, what, you know, what's the alternative, which is what I call smart content marketing. Do you practice it? Do you practice smart content marketing? Prove to me that your content is useful, that it's educational, and in some way, and overall is worth consuming. That's really key. Is it worth consuming? And the social secret behind American Idol, of course, is the voting. People get on American Idol and they get voted off until you get to the very last person and you know that that person is going to sell albums uh, for the most part. Um, <laughs> Except for that one guy, whatever his name was. Um, <laughs> and uh, they're going to sell lots of albums, they're going to sell lots of tickets to their concerts, they're going to get super popular and lend their brand to all these different um, uh, companies. Now here's the thing. The voting, that whole voting aspect of getting to the end is called crowdsourcing. Your target audience and you want to know what kind of content is going to resonate with them, just ask them. Ask them what kind of content they need, what they want. So how do we do that? And I'm going to give you a whole bunch of um, tips and tools moving forward. One, crowdsource suggestions. Every major company that has a search feature, such as Google, eBay, Amazon, YouTube, and so on, has a suggestion feature now that is now built in. So you can go to Google and you can type in digital camera and it's going to give you all these suggestions. Now the interesting thing is all these different sites actually give you different suggestions. So with Google, one of the first things to come up is digital camera reviews, which is great because you're trying to find a camera, you don't know what to buy. It's, you'll find articles with reviews, that's the suggestion. Um, a great tool, so sorry, two tools. One tool, if you, if you want to know, um, uh, do multiple options on Google, use ubersuggest.org, that's very helpful. Now, if you want to do all these different websites at the same time, use Suvel. That's actually really helpful as well. Although I'm not crazy about the way it presents, uh, it's still very helpful. Um, okay, crowdsource by lurking. Now, Quora is a question and answer website. I find it's way better than like answers.com, yahoo.com, and so on. Um, very helpful. Uh, the quality of questions, quality of answers are really good. Um, mine comments. 
Now here's the thing about mining comments. Um, mine comments is my number one um, trick or idea or tool to find new ideas. Go through people's comments, whether it's in um, blog comments, comments on YouTube. I know there's the, the, blog, um, the, the haters and the spammers and the trolls and all that. Get through all the crap. There's always a golden nugget somewhere in there. There's always some information that's super helpful. There's always an idea that you haven't thought about and you never would have thought of in a million years that somebody else thought of. You can take that idea and frequently create a whole blog post about that idea or add it to a list, say, you know, five reasons to do this and that could be one of your reasons. Um, mind those comments, very helpful. Subscribe to newsletters. Find out who else is in your industry and subscribe to the newsletters, get their updates, see what they're talking about, look for patterns. Um, go on Twitter, Instagram, uh, get involved in Twitter chats. It's very helpful to see again what people are talking about. Cross media lurking, watch and listen. Watch reviews, read reviews, um, listen to reviews, really important. Um, that really helps. And here, listening to podcasts, I mean, look at her smile, she's loving it. Uh, look for trends. This is a big one as well. Look for trends all over the internet. Go into social media, use hashtag trends, put hashtag trends and hashtag topic together, see what the trends are. There are lots of blogs and newspapers out there that are online magazines, online newspapers that will give you a completely biased view and they're open about that biased view, like an extreme view. Look at that, see what people are saying, look at the trends, you, you'll find really good information there. Go to Google, search for predictions category, search for controversies on a particular topic, look for curated articles like a best of. If you see it like, you know, top 10 best whatever software, whatever, you're going to see a pattern in all the different um, uh, suggestions. Third party poll results are really great. That will give you popular opinion. That'll show you trends in people's thinking. Um, and specialized tools. I'm going to show you just briefly uh, BuzzSumo, which I think is really cool. Here's a screenshot of BuzzSumo. Uh, what it is like, you can type in some uh, keywords, it'll give you some results on the left, and then it'll tell you how popular it is, which is really helpful. So in this case, I typed in Montreal Sushi, um, Montreal Sushi Restaurant Infested with Decomposing Mice. Well, of course, on Facebook, it gets 7.9 thousand shares, of course, because that's like, you know, negative controversial uh, information. Um, but it's really helpful. So they have a free trial, it's very basic, and then you have to pay to upgrade the service. Very, very helpful for finding trends uh, and seeing what's popular, what kind of content is popular. Okay, <laughs> what? Naked sushi oh, there's naked sushi here? All right, <laughs> all the better. Um, <laughs> growing your audience. Okay, one thing that I highly recommend you do is repurpose your content. Don't duplicate your content. So if you write this really fantastic uh, blog post, don't go and publish it all over the place. Keep it in one place, but come up with different formats for it. So this is an example of me and what I do. So this is me giving a conference talk a couple years ago, SEO and content marketing. Um, I posted my slides to SlideShare, so I got a new audience there. I wrote a blog post about some of the uh, slides that I had, and in fact, I could probably write a blog post on every single slide, um, that even that I'm presenting today, that would give me two months worth of content. Um, I wrote a guest post in social media today about some of the content that I talked about. I didn't create an infographic, but I could. Um, my video, a video of my talk was published on WordPress TV, uh, and then I created a book out of my talk. Um, so it is all different ways, different modes to actually put out uh, the information reaching different audiences. I'm going to give you kind of like the kind of thing that nobody ever shows you, but I'm happy to share it. Um, I strongly recommend a tool called Crazy Egg. It's a fantastic tool. I know everybody in the room has Google Analytics. This will take it to the next level. Um, so you're testing page layouts. So back to CityNet Magazine. So we have all these different articles. Um, this is how we've laid it out. Now, what happens with Crazy Egg is we can overlay it. So one kind of overlay is to see where people are clicking. This is really, really helpful. So a quick analysis. Um, this is an article somebody submitted actually from Toronto. Romantic ideas for waterfront adventures in Toronto. And of course, there's two people on uh, stand-up paddle boards and they're in a bikini and uh, bathing suit. And of course, people are clicking all over that. Um, you know, it was a good article, but of course, lots of people clicked on it. And here's the validation. I've got a tool that's telling me it's working. The biggest photo that I have here, uh, it worked because people are clicking on the headline and that's perfect. That's exactly what I want. If there's a new article every day and that first article is being featured, here you go. It's right here. Um, 
Here actually is very in, uh, um, interesting as well. So we have um, topics, lifestyle, travel, dating, nightlife, etc. So I noticed dating, nightlife, lifestyle, those are very popular. That's great. It suggests we should be writing more articles on those topics. Um, I noticed that almost nobody's clicking on the word interviews. So we actually changed that. We replaced it with food. So now we're looking at to see, we, we changed our food section from a sub menu to a main uh, uh, menu item to see what happens. Oh, that's pretty uh, funny. Anyways. Okay, um, another way we analyze it is with heat maps. The brighter it is, the more people look. There's a big bright white spot in the middle here, and that's telling me that maybe I can move uh, some of my articles up, or I can put some advertising in there, or I can do something else with that space. Now, this is just the top of the homepage. If you look at the whole homepage, this is very helpful as well. Notice how way at the bottom, it's really cold because nobody's scrolling down to the bottom. So I know that even uh, uh, articles that are just like um, maybe three weeks old, a couple of weeks old, very re relatively few people are actually looking at them, which is very helpful. So if you're trying to grow your audience, you want to move things around on your website to make sure that people are actually clicking on the things you want them to click on. Now, the reason I chose the Scrabble uh, pieces is that I want you to be clear. I want to be clear that social media is a game. It's a game is where people go to play. People are going to exchange ideas. They're going to be part of a community. Um, social media does not exist for marketers to go sell crap to them. Really, really important. And 99.9% .9 of the world's marketers would love to kill me right now for saying that. But it's the, it's the truth. Social media exists because social media exists. It doesn't exist for people to go bombard things to sell them to, um, which is why marketing, social media marketing is a very indirect route. It's not a direct route. Now, this is you and your friends. You're hanging out on Facebook and you're talking to your friends and, you know, talking about the hockey game last night or a uh, Blue Jays game, what have you. And some creepy, shitty, sketchy guy comes up to you and tries to sell you a letter O. Okay. <laughs> That's you. Okay, that's you in social media. That's you on Facebook trying to sell crap to people. They're not interested. It's like, what is this guy doing here? We're just hanging out. We don't need this guy. N no interest. When you're promoting your content, don't shove it down people's throats. Now, it's not about being everywhere. It's about being in the right place for your strategy. And these are my last few slides. Let me explain. You need to adapt and customize your campaigns. Now, if you have videos, for example, YouTube is the, number one, is the number two search engine after Google, and it's owned by Google anyways. Uh, more people visit YouTube, and they type words, keywords into that search box at the top of YouTube than they do in Yahoo or Bing or any other search engine combined, which is remarkable. So you need to consider YouTube. And anyone creating videos is obviously thinking, I'm sure everyone in the room is, of course, if I had a video, YouTube, of course. But there's more. There's Instagram, Vine, Blip. Um, Snapchat, there's different kinds of videos and they have different purposes. So let me just explain briefly. Um, Koji Korean Barbecue, it's a series of barbecue trucks in LA. And what they did was um, they initially created videos of their truck. And you know, people looked at them, they went to YouTube, they're like, yeah, videos of a barbecue you know, food truck. Okay, so what? Like nobody really cared. It doesn't really help. So they changed platforms and they said, wait a minute, what do people really want? How do we anticipate our customers' needs? How do we reach them? How do we help them? How can we offer them content that's actually helpful? So what do they do? They switch platforms and they go into Twitter and they say from now on, they, I think at the time they had like five trucks. Whenever a truck is parked somewhere, first thing in the morning, we're gonna tweet out where we're parked so people can come find us. That's really great. It helps your customers and it helps your business. That's using Twitter appropriately and the right way. And my last one, I'm gonna show you this, uh, let's see, okay. I'm gonna show you this 15 second clip and then I'll talk about it. <laughs> All right, great end result. Really cute Pac-Man nails, I love it. So here's the thing. On YouTube? No. Because nobody's going to watch a 15 second video on YouTube because no one cares. It doesn't work, right? So this is an account on Instagram called Banicured, and you can see it here, um, run by a girl named Banna. And what she does is she's a, like a certified nail technician, something, some, some 
Okay, she has some appropriate certification for where she's located. Uh, I think it's in California. And um, she sells, she also sells a line of uh, nail polish and various related products. When you go to her Instagram account, you watch the videos, you like the videos, learn from the videos, and you click the link in her profile and you go buy the nail she gets a commission on every sale. That's her business model. She has over 500,000 followers and she puts these out every few days. She puts out new videos. It's phenomenal. It's astounding. Now think about it. Just like Jay, for those of you who were in Jay's talk in the, in the last talk when he showed the Mona Lisa and he's like, here's a picture of the Mona Lisa. Here's a thousand words describing the Mona Lisa. How do you pair. It's the same thing. You're not going to explain, okay, now apply the nail polish this way and now put it this way. And now change colors. Nobody's going to read a blog post on this. Maybe you could take photos at each step of the way and give like a, a, a step by step, but the best way to actually get the message across and to help people out was to put it that was the right platform. That was finding the audience on the right, the, and the correct audience, the ideal audience on the right platform with the right content, and it works for her. And that's my suggestion to, do, to you. Um, find the audience, find your personas, find the services you want to offer them, put them together, create content that they're looking for and what those people want. And that's what I have for you today. So thank you. <laughs>